Hi, Sue. Hi, Gilberto. Can Hi. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Very nice to have you here, Sue, today. Uh, just before we start, uh, Gilberto will introduce you. I'll just say a few words in Portuguese for the audience. Uh, just a moment, please. So, uh, pessoal, então, boa tarde todo mundo, sejam bem-vindos. Só lembrar, então, que para quem fez a inscrição né, no, no, no evento My Friend is Massa, para emissão de certificado, vocês têm que assinar a lista de presença, que vai ser é, disponibilizada no chat é, durante o seminário, tá bom? Fiquem tranquilos que nós vamos é, passar o, a lista mais tarde. É, então, acho que é isso. Qualquer coisa, qualquer dúvida, vocês mandam aí no chat. E lembrando também para fazer perguntas no final para a Su. Se quiser escrever em português, não tem problema, a gente traduz para ela, tá bom? So, uh, let's uh, change the gears to English again. So, again, thank you, Su. Oh, please, just, Gilberto, introduce for us this lovely lady. Yes, Tiago. Hi, Su. I'll say a few words before... I salute you, but I'll say a few words in Portuguese also quickly before introducing you, just to welcome the students. Well, bem-vindos ao segundo seminário, do segundo ciclo do, do, do My Friend Espaça. É, eu queria agradecer o apoio da Nova Analítica, ela permitiu que a gente profissionalizasse os seminários e também ela, ela deu fundos, né? pode prover fundos para a premiação. É, Bem-vindo a todos, vocês terão um excelente seminário hoje, como serão vários. Eu vou dizer umas palavras em inglês, que eu gostaria que as estudantes, principalmente as estudantes, prestassem bastante atenção. Eu passo agora a introduzir a doutora Susan Weintraub. Uh, before introducing you, Su, uh, I have uh, some additional important points I want to stress. Uh, you all know that BRPROT, our Brazilian Society of Proteomics, is an equal society. And this is very important for us. Uh, following this, uh, this reasoning, this philosophy, we selected the group that organizes the M M F I M. We selected three outstanding women of science to lecture in our seminars. Today, we listen to the first one, Dr. Susan Weintraub. Next week, we have Dr. Jennifer Van Eyck from Cedar Sinai Medical Center, California, USA, and then Dr. Solange Serrano from Instituto Butantã, Sao Paulo, on July 15, I guess. What I want to remember and stress is the outstanding professional path of these three women. We are proud. Wishes, our wishes are that they inspire and be a model to the outstanding scientific achievements. A model of outstanding scientific achievements, as a matter of fact, for the Brazilian young women of science. They inspire me as well, so I hope they will inspire you. Uh, Dr. Susan is a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Structural Biology, as well as director of the University of Texas, Texas Healthcare Center in San Antonio, the laboratory of institution mass spectrometry. I have, uh, she has been in biomedical mass spectrometry since the early 60s. 70s. On, 70s. 70s, yeah, I'm sorry, 70s. Uh, working on, on, on quantitative analysis of choline and acetylcholine or choline in rat brain. Those are small molecules using GCMS. In, a, in the 80s, the focus changed to the analysis of lipids. But uh, in then, when uh, we had mass spectrometry became uh, uh, 
uh, high mass molecular weight uh, analytes could analyze high molecular weight analyze that's a matter of fact changing to protein cor protein characterization by mass spectrometry she she uh, changed uh, her focus so she she has over almost 200 scientific papers published in peer-reviewed journals sick book chapters and uh, uh she also besides that she 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 has a career on scientific uh, uh, political uh, institutions as well as uh, scientific administration in science. She served in the board of directors of the American Society for Mass Spectrometry. She occupied several places there, secretary mem member at large for publications, vice president for programs, and president of the American Society for Mass Spectrometry, as well as past president. Now, she is vice president of the International Human Protein Organization, a member of the HUPO Council and chair of the Mass Spectrometry Resource Pillar. Uh, I have been, I have a personal experience with Susan. We were associate editor. I was with her at the time, JPR, the Journal Protein Research. And I have other impressions of her. She strongly impressed me as a dedicated and caring person. Uh, and I thank Sue for sharing this caringness with me. I love you, Sue. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And I hope that uh, the students get your message. You are an outstanding scientist, an outstanding person, and a mother for the young Brazilian scientists. I hope they enjoy you. Thank you again. It's your turn now. Okay, thank you so much, Gilberto. I have so much enjoyed our interaction, and we did first meet in person at a JPR editor's yeah. meeting. <laughs> thank and you. I've tried ever since at any conference to have dinner uh, together. Yes. So, uh, and I, you can see, I'm delighted to be here to speak with you. I, on this, I can make the joke, excellent, exciting day. For you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I do know a little Spanish, but no Portuguese. Um, I have been involved in biomedical mass spectrometry, as Gilberto said, since the early 70s, and at the same institution. Uh, which is amazing when I look at the picture that's fairly current. Uh, this building here, uh, there was not much more when I started there approximately 51 years ago. And it seems impossible to me unless I started when I was five, but uh, we know that's not true. It has been phenomenal to be able to see the changes in biomedical mass spectrometry and the instrumentation that has made it possible to answer questions we never even could consider. I know last week you heard what sounded like a phenomenal talk on, I just can't even envision how the technology works to answer uh, other kinds of questions. But today we're going to focus more on technology for more standard biomedical uh, analyses I will say that the data independent acquisition that I'll tell you mostly about, to me is the most exciting thing I've worked on in at least 20 years. And it's what keeps me going and gets me up really early if there's a data set that's going to be ready for me to look at. Uh, as those of you who have used mass spectrometry or submitted samples for analysis, there's many types of questions that can be answered. And the ones I have listed here are in the context of a core facility, which I've run since 1979. And you can see that there are some very simple measurements such as molecular weight determination, identifying proteins. And as you go down the list, it becomes a little bit more complicated and requiring different instrumentation, identifying sites of modification and quantitative analysis. And today we're going to focus just on identification 
but in the context of quantitative analysis without the use of stable isotopes, and that all of it will be relative uh, to one another. As you may know, there's two general types of protein analysis by mass spectrometry when we're looking for sequence information, top-down and bottom-up. Top-down is the method where you start with a protein intact and you let the mass spectrometer do the fragmentation to give you sequence information. While in bottom-up, the protein is digested with an enzyme, most often trypsin, to generate peptides, and then the mass spectrometer uh, fragments these peptides into ions that provide information about the sequence. And there's many different ways this can be done in many different types of instruments. <clears throat> the general workflow in <clears throat> almost any of these systems will start with very careful sample prep, <clears throat> because the more carefully the sample is made and more reproducible, the better your quantitative data will be. You digest and in many cases separate by high performance liquid chromatography into peaks. Most of these are going to contain a, a large number of individual peptides. Everything I'll show you today, ionization is by electrospray ionization. And the first step is to generate a full scan spectrum precursor ion or parent ion, depends on how you call it. And so each of these peaks is representing a different peptide with some amount of charge on it. And the colors are shown because in the first type of analysis I'm going to show you here, the more traditional data-dependent acquisition, the instrument is programmed to start with the most abundant um, ion, isolate it, fragment it, and give a fragmentation spectrum. And then it goes in sequence for some amount of time to the next most abundant, next and next, until it goes down to whatever amount of time you have. And then it'll start over. Usually these will go onto a list uh, for some amount of seconds not to be acquired. Now this has been a phenomenal uh, method that has given vast amounts of information, as I'm sure many of you know. And I, I always like to make sure there's a little bit of science chemistry in here because I talk about biochemistry and we have to remember that there are chemical formulas and ions. And this is the uh, general structure for a triptych peptide with lysine at the C terminus. In this case, it's shown with two uh, charges on it. And in the mass spectrometer, the predominant ways you can fragment it by applying extra energy is down the peptide backbone. How this happens will depend on what kind of instrument and what kind of energy, but everything I'll show you today in the most traditional style, you get ions that are called Y if the charge stays on the C terminus, and they're called B if the charge stays on the amino terminus. And you can see how you can get a variety of different ions formed in this way. You can predict in silico in the computer what the various ions might be for any peptide. This is not saying which ones are more likely, which ones form easier than the others, or which ionize better. But it's important to be able to know what masses might uh, be produced. Where this story is going to start is a few years ago, one of my colleagues, who is a cancer researcher, had uh, discovered a drug that in combination with another drug, so their one that they discovered was called ERX11, and palbocyclib is used uh, in the clinic, that when you put the two of them together, the effect was much greater than either one alone. You can see this in tumor xenografts and in patient-derived explants, that the combo was much better. He had already gotten some sequence data and RNA-seq, but really wanted to look at the proteins because uh, he felt that was much more important for his uh, identification of what the mechanism of action of this drug was. And so he brought us some samples of the 
cancer cells alone, nothing, with one drug, the other drug, and the combination. And for many years, the way we've run analysis is to put a lysate on a 1D gel and then cut a lane into slices. Many times we only use six slices, but this case we used 12 slices. And then each slice gets cut out, excised, destained, reduced and alkylated to take care of the cysteines, digested with trypsin, analyzed by HPLC tandem mass spectrometry, database searching, we use mascot, and then processing and scaffold. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with a lot of these steps. What we do is we then uh, have the option in scaffold, and I, I love scaffold because it makes it very easy to visualize and examine the data. Uh, and we could either look at each slice alone, but more important, we want to be able to combine them. This is what a typical scaffold outlook uh, output looks like that um, fortunately I can give a file to the people who bring the samples and they can do the same thing examining it that I do. And in this case, there were 5,923 proteins identified once you take out the decoys that are used to determine the false discovery rate. And if we look at the, the ones at the top, just so that you can see them, the results that are shown are in spectral counts, meaning this is the number of peptide spectrum matches that have been assigned at the confidence level we've set uh, for this protein. You can see some very common ones. Many times people would see keratin and assume that that is a contaminant from handling the sample, but not when it's at the top of the list because it's also a cytoskeletal protein that's very important. You see gap DH and et cetera. And so this is a large number of spectra assigned. For the most part, they look similar across the samples. Well, we looked at a few of the proteins of interest to my colleague. And he was very excited, for example, to see KI67, a proliferation marker, was way down in the combination compared to any of the others. So this looked very promising uh, because we were seeing differences relative to the drugs. Well, I asked Dana, who works for me, how long did it take to do this preparation? And she said it took four days for sample prep, and she added in they were very painful days because she had a lot of pipetting to do. MS analysis, database searching, scaffold processing, put it all together, it took 17 days, and there was only one replicate of each group, and that was using spectral counting for quantitative analysis, which is good, but not fabulous. So I knew we needed something else if we were going to move forward doing large-scale quantitative analysis. First thing that we had to take care of was sample prep, because we obviously couldn't do gels. And for many of the techniques under consideration, you want all of the sample together, not in slices from a gel. This was resolved using a device called an S-trap from a small company called Protify. That's a, column, a spin column type system where you do all of the preparation on a solid support. And now you see you have much shorter times for lysis. Very important to notice, we do protein concentration first to make sure we load equal quantities of protein, process with the S-trap for digestion and then cleanup. And then very important also, peptide quantitative analysis so that we know exactly how much we're loading onto the HPLC column. Well, one thing to consider is why not use one of the isobaric tagging based methods such as ITRAC and TMT. I'm sure you've seen many literature uh, papers about this and uh, people love it because you can multiplex, but I've never really been a fan in my hands of doing it for several reasons. First off, the reagents are very expensive. I'm an analytical chemist who's very picky. 
To do it right, you really should verify the efficiency of derivatization for every sample before you mix it. That's a lot of extra instrument time, and if you have to go, then go back and re-derivatize. For complex samples, you have to pre-fractionate, either high pH reverse phase or ion exchange. So you really are not gaining on the number of injections. There's serious limitations in experimental design for doing comparisons. Analytically, there's problems with precursor co-isolation and ratio compression in the mass spectrometer that can compromise the quantitative values. Uh, there are new scan functions that can take care of this, but that's at the expense of numbers of proteins identified. And then also you only get one quantitative, I call it read, per peptide if you use what's called dynamic exclusion so that you measure one peptide and then go on to others for some amount of time. So I really have not been interested in doing uh, one of these methods. That meant I needed to find another solution. You could consider using this data dependent method as I've showed you, make one sample, and some people have used a very long gradient, like a six or 10 hour gradient to get information based quantitatively on precursor ions. But one of the big problems with bottom up with data dependent is you're gonna eventually, you don't really sample all of these ions and you end up having many peptides that do not get fragmented. If they're not fragmented, they're not identified. Another option that I'd heard of is called data independent acquisition. Here, instead of letting the instrument decide which peptide to fragment, you set up your entire scan into a series of windows. There's many different styles of windows. There's just one shown here where well, we cover between 400 and 1,000 because the bulk of peptide spectra show up in that mass range. And in this case, we're making 25 even windows of 24 M over Z units. And each one is scanned sequentially, one at a time. And if you take, for example, this one right here, you are fragmenting everything that is in this window instead of one ion at a time you can make a spectrum. And then the key is to have software that is able to interpret the spectra and associate it back with proteins and quantities. So why might this be better than DDA, data dependent, in addition to be able to identify many more proteins than with uh, DDA, data independent acquisition, DIA, is more accurate quantitatively. This is an experiment that Brian Searle uh, did. Brian wrote a lot of the software that goes into Scaffold, both the uh, one for DDA and DIA. And, and I don't have time to explain this entire experiment, but I'd be happy to later if you're interested. But what you find out with a variety of windows of DIA compared to DDA, the answer is more accurate. He had an actual sample that he knew what uh, many of the ratios were. But more importantly, besides being more close to the known number, the variability is much smaller for data independent acquisition. You can see that particularly on the slide on the right, where with DIA, you very quickly start having large variability of your peptides, while for DIA, you get almost up to the end before you get some variability. So I was definitely in, interested in using this method. You uh, have lots of options. Again, I'm not going to go into details here, but the one that we use that works very well is you have any number of quantitative samples, experimental samples, but you make a pool of it and can run a separate style of analysis using also DIA to make what's called a chromatogram library. And this ends up being what you search against to get really outstanding results. And this is the method that I'm using on all the data that I'll be showing you now. I can show you the end result before going into the examples. 
Now for three replicates, sample prep and all, these are the days it took, a total of five and a quarter days. We identified, quantified 6,000 proteins and had a really outstanding quantitative data. All right, so we were convinced we were ready to use this for a real sample. Another colleague was interested in studying chromatin and uh, particularly the chromatin fraction from some cancer cells. We still, even today, that we do a whole lot of DIA analysis, often put an initial sample on a 1D gel because you do get a sense of the relative complexity of the sample and the distribution of proteins. And here we looked at several different um, volumes loaded to get um, a measure of what amount we wanted to use. And again, we tried this one. We thought, okay, this we want to be sure what the results are going to be. So we'll also do our standard method of cutting in slices, doing the digestion analysis by MS. Here's another uh, scaffold view. In this case, I have them divided in cell one and cell two because he took those cells and transformed them. But he wanted to know what proteins were changed. Since this is the chromatin fraction, there's not as many as in a whole cell lysate. There were 1,700. And again, this is the spectrum counts, the number of spectra assigned to each protein. In the software, you can do a t-test because now we have three replicates from each experiment, experimental group. And if it's green uh, highlighted here, it's significant. I'm going to sort by p-value so that the very lowest number, meaning the most significant, is on the top. And you can see just from the visual image that there's no signal in cell one and signal in cell two for these proteins and the opposite over here. So we knew already there were some very striking differences. If you scroll down, you see that there were 788 proteins that were significant with multiple testing correction, which means they were very highly significant. Again, this is just based on spectral counts. Well, that's very meaningful, but I wanted to see how can DIA do with this. We took the same samples and ran them using windows for fragmentation rather than letting the instrument do the decision of what to fragment. And the first thing that I always do when I have a data set is put it in run order because all of the samples need to be uh, blocked and randomized so that you don't get any errors that are related to processing or analysis. And we do this also for the processing. And you can see very clearly the colors here are relative to the intensity. And so what we don't want to see is that a color is changing in some order across the set, meaning there's a problem that's increasing or decreasing across the run order. And if we look at the top group here, instead of having spectral counts, now we have an actual number that represents the summed intensities of all the peptides that are found for this particular protein. And all that I want you to see here is that uh, very quickly, uh, these are in run order, but cell one and cell one here, their intensity numbers are clearly very different from cell two. All right. In all quantitative analysis based on mass spectrometry, there is one fundamental requirement and expectation that if you generate peptides by proteolytic digestion, you expect that you're going to make the same peptides from every sample and that the relative proportion of their quantity is going to be the same across samples. They're going to be different from one another depending on the sequence and how they ionize and the chemistry uh, of the residues and how. Um, they fragment in by the enzyme. But then for DIA analysis, we have the next step, is that we also expect that the relative abundance of the individual peptide fragment ions is the same every time. 
Now, this makes sense if you look back and think of what a spectrum looks like. And if you analyze a peptide again and again on the same instrument with the same settings, you expect to see the same spectrum. And that's essential for DIA. And with the software that I use of Scaffold DIA, uh, you are only doing your quantitative analysis based on the peptide fragments. Fortunately, in the software, we are able to look at this and verify. Now, when you've got 6,000 proteins, you're obviously not going to look at every single peptide and fragment. But, for example, if you find something unexpected or really a marvelous protein that you see changing, you want to go and take a look. Because I think no matter how much software we have in computer, you've got to use this computer and the, this camera right here to make sure that it makes sense. And what we see here is all of the fragment ions, and you can see which ones they are. The software is set uh, the way we use it to only pick five, even though there could be more, but five it turns out to be enough. And if these fragments are coming from the same peptide, and the peptide has eluded in the HPLC, then the fragments have to elute at the same time. And the software finds fragments that are eluding at the same time, and then it tries to assign them to a protein. And when it's able to do that, then we can tell that these are ions that have the charge that stayed on the C terminus or on the Y terminus, but they go together. But then again, the expectation is that if we see this ratio, it should be the same for all peptides that uh, are in these samples prepared the same. Notice, for example, the purple one here, uh, purple and the gold, because we've got purple and gold here. And in the software, you can look at the fragment intensities. And no matter how much the absolute intensity changes, you expect that the fragments are all the same. And you can see that's the largest is the purple, and then the gold was next. So we have confidence in these quantitative values in addition to the IDs. All right, you may have noticed on the slide, there was a label that said exclusive intensity. This is another absolutely critical point because for quantitative data, it's best if you only look at peptides that are not shared with another protein. For this protein, PLRG1, we have no concerns because all of the peptides are only in this protein. There's another protein that shares them, but there's no independent evidence for its presence. But look what happens here for PP1, and it came up with a B as the hit. There's three forms of it, B, A, and G, and they share a very large number of peptides. And you can see here that for the G form, there's only two that are exclusive. There's three shared with A and a large number that are shared with A and B. Well, why does that matter? If you look at the quantitative data, you see that the B and G forms are a much lower relative abundance than the A. That means if you counted them all together, you would have a very large overrepresentation of G and B because the value would be skewed by the presence of A. Now, in some programs, they use what's called razor peptides. And I'm not a fan of this because in a razor peptide, it says which protein is there in more abundance, and we're going to give everything to that protein and only. Uh, and not to the other forms. So anything that's shared for A would be given all to A. Well, that isn't good either because then you'd be adding in proportions of B and G and you would have overrepresentation of A. So therefore, in all of the work that I do in Scaffold, with Scaffold DIA, we use only exclusive peptides. You can look at the shared ones, it's no problem. But we only use this for the quantitative data. All right, so here we are back for the run order. And now I'm going to switch and put it into the groups. It's very easy in the software to do this. 
and do the t-test again we see lots of pro of uh, proteins that are significantly different again i'm going to sort it and visually uh, now we see very clear separation i'm going to scroll all the way down and instead of 788 proteins uh, the total i didn't mention was 3300 and we have 2400 which is an extraordinary number that are significantly different with multiple testing correction. Here, the ones in gold are significant at PO5. Uh, you can do in the software a principal component analysis. Um, oh, I jumped ahead there. Uh, you is best to look at uh, fold changes and relative differences in the log2 form so that the amount up and amount down are proportionally the same. When you set it this way, you can see the very striking difference between cell one and cell two, but also the wonderful reproducibility of the biological replicates here, just from looking at the colors. Now we go to the principal component analysis. Not surprisingly, you have a giant difference between the two cells. Well, I wanted to see how does it compare? How are the results comparing with the DDA? And this is back to that uh, slide I showed you before. And I've picked out two, for example, DYHC1, where there were no spectra assigned at all for cell one, and two spectra each sample in cell two, or TCP4, where there was clearly more in cell one than in cell two, but in cell two, there were two missing. So let's see how the DIA data is, or R. Um, and you can see here that while there were no signals for cell one, in fact, there really were very nice intensities in the DIA data. And what this means is that there were just other more abundant peptides at that time, and nothing got fragmented, so it couldn't get counted. Likewise, over for the TCP4, you have a clear difference between them, but definitely a signal for all three. If we look at this in the log two, you get a sense of the measure where there's a fourfold difference up or down relative to uh, cell one. So these results uh, really were very convincing that this was the only way we wanted to go. I want to show you a few more examples now because I'm hoping you'll also see some very interesting things that you need to consider when you're doing your experiments. In this case, this was some mouse neural stem cells, and the idea was to treat with a vehicle or two different doses of drugs. And the reason that's separated by male and female is what the investigator did had three different female mice, took from each one a male and a female offspring, isolated the uh, neural stem cells from them, and then treated samples with either the vehicle dose one or dose two of the drug. I, we analyzed all of these by DIA MS, put it into scaffold, and when you do the PCA analysis, what you see is, oh, there's some interesting clusters. And when you find out what these clusters are, amazingly, they are separating by mother and then by the sex of the offspring. And what this tells you that is, at least in this experiment, if you had put all of them together, you wouldn't find any differences from your experimental treatment because it would be obscured by the variability among the samples. Or if you just had all males, the same thing would happen, or all females. But if you do a two or three factor analysis where you um, first look at the separation and then you look for the differences, then you're able to find many effects of this drug. This was very surprising both to the investigator and we hadn't seen it because we really haven't looked at male and female at the same time. But it did bring to mind a number of studies that I was involved in and would hear about when we were doing uh, 
fetal maternal nutrition, uh, where many times, for example, placental function was different depending on the sex of the fetus. So it's very critical that you take this into consideration, but also even the different uh, mothers if you are doing animal studies. All right, here's another uh, experiment. And this is actually looking at hepatocellular, so liver cancer. In this case, there were samples from the liver tumors and then what's called adjacent non tumor sample. So you don't want to call it normal or control because you really don't know, but you know that it hasn't been uh, considered to be cancer. We ran all of these in DIA and these are sorted uh, uh, according to the samples. And I'm going to skip ahead again to the PCA. And what you notice is that the green ones are the non-tumor the purple are the tumor. All of these green cluster very nicely, except for these two. Now you would expect that the tumor samples would be more variable because there's such differences among uh, cancer. But when they went back and looked at the data for these two, it was clear there was something odd with them. And you can see on the next slide, there uh, was, uh, we had actually done a pilot study first to make sure we should go on with the larger number. Again, the non-tumor samples clustered well, the tumors were more variable, and therefore it was decided for any subsequent analysis to exclude these two samples and their uh, related tumor samples. The investigator was able to put the results uh, and correlate them with the RNA-seq data, the message. And what you can see is that this is the number of differentially expressed genes, differentially expressed proteins. There was only 30 that overlapped. And this is very typical of what happens in that you can't necessarily extrapolate from RNA-seq data to protein data there are many proteins that are expected to uh, be correlating, but many times they're very different. And quite a few of the investigators who I work with are more interested these days in the protein than the, the message because they want to see the effect in the biological system. Now, the last example that I want to show you is from a bladder cancer, urothelical cancer cells where these cells were isolated from patients and then cultured and then we analyzed them. Not cultured, they're just isolated from the patients and then uh, lysed and we analyzed them. And again, this is in the run order and exclusive intensity. Uh, again, very important, but looking at the run order, you can see there's no systematic problem there. There were 4,800 proteins identified and I We'll say the number of proteins identified depends on the cells and the sample. We've had cell culture where you get six or 7,000 and some uh, four or five. When we did PCA of this, uh, the investigator had really expected that the tumors and results would cluster based on the grade of the tumor, high or low. But in fact, they really didn't, and they didn't correlate at all with that. What I did is I saw that what looked like there was maybe two or three different groups. And I arbitrarily called one L for left, R for right, and put this M in the middle. I categorized the samples and organized them now by left, middle, and right. And what you see after doing a t-test, and this is a t-test on left versus right, there's very clearly many differences that show up between the L group and the R group. Doing a volcano plot of these data, the dots in green, each one represents a protein that is significantly different between L and R uh, with a benjamini hochberg multiple testing correction. And that's really a very extraordinary difference between them and the ones in gold are PO5. Well, I took 
the ones here, and you can see, for example, this protein spot in the software when we go and look at the result, very clearly there's a striking difference between the four tumor samples that were in the right side versus the left. Now, we don't know what is driving the difference between L and R, but you can take the results and subject them to pathway analysis. And this is the end result of uh, Reactome, which is a site that's uh, no charge to go to. It is uh, produced and provided by the EBI in the UK. And uh, it's an absolutely amazing curation of pathways. There are other uh, commercially available and other sites that you can use, but I like this one the best. And I also know the people and trust what they have done to generate it. And what you see here, and not all I've taken are the accession numbers of the proteins that changed. Most times I use the ones that go down separately from the ones up in the comparison because different pathways are often overrepresented. And what you have to think of in a pathway analysis is let's say you're going to submit 500 proteins to analysis. If you took 500 proteins at random from the database and subjected to analysis, they would be distributed across all of the different uh, pathways and reactions. And even if you did this a large number of times with 500 different proteins, you're not going to end up except by some chance of having them reproducibly in the same uh, pathway or system. While here, you have numbers of these uh, biological processes that are what's called overrepresented. So it means that there's more represented in there than would be found by chance. And in the software, this is really like playing a video game because once you have this display, then you can click in each one of these areas and dig down and get an amazing amount of information. You can see several pathways are very clearly overrepresented by down, and different ones are by up. Now, we're planning in this project to move forward with a very large number of samples, uh, between 70 maybe, or even up to 100 eventually, because we need to have more patient characteristics to find out what are the differences. Um, and that's something that I'm looking forward to being able to find those answers. And ultimately, this information can be used both to help for diagnosis and understanding in treatment and uh, following the progress of treatment. So that's uh, work that is ongoing. So I want to acknowledge, I have to, my dear co-workers, Sam Pardo and Dana Muller, absolutely couldn't do this. I tend to use what I call the royal we because they're doing all of the work. All I do in the lab is I do pack the HPLC columns. I've been doing that. Um, I even have the same bottle of packing material for the last 20 years. Uh, so uh, just packed one this Sunday. But they are absolutely amazing. And then I thank my institution and our cancer center uh, for support, uh, National Institutes of Health for purchase of equipment, and the University of Texas system who paid for the Lumos mass spectrometer that I used um, for doing all of the DIA analyses. And I'm happy to answer questions. And also what I'd like to tell you is that if you're interested in DIA and would like to perhaps meet, I'd be happy to set up a Zoom session with you and talk to you about your project or show you some of the data uh, directly from the software. And you can then decide if it's something uh, that perhaps you want to be able to do. And I'll show you here our uh, Texas blue bonnets. In the spring, the fields are full of these and uh, it's a wonderful thing to see. And then we know it's spring. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Sue, for the very, very, very insightful talk. And it was a real lecture for us for DIA. Uh, before we start receiving comments and, and questions from, from the audience, there are already some coming. I just have a few questions. So as far as understood, you don't do any 
pre-fractionation prior your LC run, right? No. We, okay. we, we use a two-hour gradient, okay. uh, but it does depend on complexity. If we have a less complex sample, we can use a shorter gradient. Um, it is something, and I also do not use a trap column. Mm -hmm. uh, we yeah. uh, inject directly, and then for all the years, starting with my very first LCMS instrument, we turn the voltage off during the first five minutes and let it sit at the bottom of the gradient. This lets salt wash off of the column and not okay. dirty up the uh, inlet of the instrument. Oh, that, 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 that's actually a really nice tip. So, so as far as understood, you, you then, you turn off the, the voltage, well, in the, but how, for how long in, during well, the loading? Well, it depends uh, on ours. I'd have to really look and see, is it okay, five or yeah. 10 minutes? But okay. this is something, fortunately, today with mass spectrometers, you just program it that way. I don't know other yeah. people who do this, but I will tell you that our HBLC columns, because the lab staff prepares them very carefully, we also do not use any uh, cleanup tips okay. off of the gel. They're clean enough the way they prepare them and off of the uh, S-traps, they're great. Um, the column will last months, months and months. Okay. So uh, it, it's... And, and, and you, you don't use trap column because you think you can lose some peptides? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. I see what you mean. And and do do you have do you know roughly how much amount the amount of peptide that, of sample that you load for yes. each? Well, for our for our DIA, we tend to load two micrograms. Uh, okay. If we have plenty of sample, and I'm talking about from a lysate, we would load ten mm -hmm. micrograms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if we have plenty, we like to start with 100 micrograms on the S-trap, and that's just so that you have no losses of sample handling. The, the mass spectrometer uh, samples are running right now where we're injecting, uh, I think, 25, um, no, not 25, 250. So let's see. Mm, that's terrible. I'm blanking on how much he's putting in because normally it would be two micrograms. So it must be a, a quarter of a microgram because it's okay. a very low uh, concentration sample, a low quantity of peptides and proteins. And does it, and I mean, uh, I must say that I'm, I don't use very much DIA, but not because I don't want it, just because of instrument time. And sometimes I just use like to, to multiplex with uh, labeling, but I do know that this ratio compression, I was amazed, for example, with her volcano plots, is so widely di distributed. And when you go for TNT and things like that, just like plus minus uh, one log, right? It's, uh, well, it's the other, really, the really... Other, the other reasons, uh, really, I don't want to pre-fractionate, but I want to have the luxury of doing comparisons across many different ways. And if you, once you put your mixture together in TMT, Yes, it's true. You could put in a reference set and then have the same reference set in multiple samples. Mm -hmm. um, I I think this is much more efficient because it's one injection per sample. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and I must say that uh, it's it's not being like something that uh, because I'm kind of saving. For example, again, let me try to rephrase it. Do you think because for DIA? Sample prep is really important to be really, really thoroughly uh, done, right? So, and then you're using the S trap that somehow it uh, it makes everything more or less normal. You normalize the way that you're doing your sample prep. Uh, do you think it still works really well if you do normal sample preparation without the S trap? Let's say in gel digestion. And in gel digestion is absolutely fine. So, so, sorry, in solution digestion. Sorry. Well, we we prefer the S trap because the S trap uh, it it's equivalent in concept to solution, mm -hmm. but many times in solution digestion you need to use a, a cleanup tip. Yes. And with the S trap you don't need a cleanup tip. With the S trap you do the digestion in the presence of SDS. 
Mm -hmm. You don't need to add urea, so you have less chance of any kind of urea adux. Yes. And uh, we've just found that they are very efficient. The lab staff far prefers using S-TRAP over regular solution digestion because they said they're, you can put them in the centrifuge, you just you put the solutions on and you let them sit and do whatever you need and then you spin them and, um, and then they're clean when they come out. Okay, yeah. Uh, just my last question, then I'll, I'll go to the audience. Uh, what, about, what about for fossil protein, for instance? Are you, if you do that, you also go for, for DIA in the same setup? Well, I, I will tell you that we don't do any traditional phosphoproteomics okay. looking for large scale of how many phosphopeptides you can find. Brian Searle has done this by DIA and has some publications, and it is definitely doable. It You do need to have, um, it's best if you have a phosphopeptide spectral library, but mm -hmm. I believe you can get them, they're now available uh, from the literature. The reason we're not doing it is because none of my investigators have a project that I think is best for doing that question. More we look at individual target proteins where they will enrich for a protein of interest and then we look for sites of modification. Okay, I see. So let me go for the audience. So I don't know if you can see, there is a question from Marcelo. She first say that uh, amazing. Can, can, can you see it or? I'm, I'm, yes, I'm going to. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put down my slides so I can see it. Great. Okay. There. Ah, this is this. Uh, today is an answer, so I, I guess everybody can see the question. Yes, yes, okay. thank you. I, I love this interface. It's so much easier for people to see the Q&A. Uh, <laughs> there is one uh, other technology that I didn't bring up that has made this really possible, and that's called ProSit. So mm -hmm. in the past, you got the best results if you used a spectral library we started using a human library that was available that someone else had generated. But ProSit is a way that you generate a predicted spectral library. And the results are spectacular. So the way we do it is uh, we do uh, for regular sample sets, we make this pool of all of the samples and inject using three different mass ranges. They're called gas phase fractions. And then you search that against a ProSit spectral library. You use the result of that search to then search all of your experimental samples. And that's how you get the results. So we've done now, but I run quite a few samples from a university called Texas A&M that has uh, got a lot of uh, agricultural and, and animal work. And we've run horse samples, goat, uh, I'm trying to think there's a few other species that, uh, and in the past that would have been really difficult because we would have had to generate a species specific library. But now all you do is can generate a ProSit library. I will say, and then I'm not sure what Jenny Van Eyck will talk about in her presentation. She does some extraordinary work, but it is more focused and so they have very, very, what you would call deep spectral libraries, but they're specific for her project. For us, we can't do that because we're getting samples. You saw just in the transformed cells, they were different. Different cell lines give you amazingly different results. And so we don't have the time to be able to generate a spectral library that is that deep. But the, the ProSit results, there is a, a paper, I'd have to find the um, citation and send it to you, that compares the different uh, strategies. And using the ProSit library with the chromatogram library is the best. Great. 
she, she also asked it, I think it's more or less the same as I asked it about like the how long is it your DIA run? You said that's around like two hours, right? Uh, well, we, we choose, th this is a, a very, um, it very dependent on your column, on the sample, and I ha we, we tested in the beginning different gradients. In the end, we picked two hours because it worked well for all of them. Now, I will say that with my home pack columns, Brian Searle helped me quite a bit in the beginning, and he said my peaks are broader than the peaks in his columns and in some commercial columns. It, that has an interesting advantage because you have less risk of losing peaks across the top of the chromatogram because you want to have at least, say, seven or nine uh, samples across so that you can get good uh, quantitative analysis. Yes. And with my peaks not being ultra sharp, we're always at any place along the gradient going to have enough points. Um, uh, the samples that are running right now, we're doing a, a one hour gradient. There's people who push it to much shorter. The only thing you're going to lose is you're going to have a few less proteins identified and you'll probably have a little more variability of quantitative analysis. But if you have a really large number of samples, um, then you may say, okay, I'd rather get them faster and I'll settle for 4,500 proteins instead of 6,000. Mm -hmm. um, but we also do a fairly long mm -hmm. equilibration between. Uh, so it, a, a two hour gradient ends up taking three hours. But we do a double, a double ramp on the wash to minimize carryover. Okay. And then the PTMs. Yes. It's absolutely possible. Uh, we've not done it in any depth, uh, but that and and what I don't know, and I'd have to talk to Brian about it, is I would imagine that you can also generate a PTM ProSit library. I bet. Uh, people are working on that, and uh, I probably the very best quantitative data will be with an actual spectral library. But there's also ones that I know Brian has generated a huge one that are available for people. Um, I, I would just have to find the sites. Brian has recently moved from University of Washington to um, in Ohio, Ohio State. And uh, he's a, a marvelous resource. Great. So we have one more question from Magno. And yeah, that's a good one too. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. I, I have a Lumos and I don't feel that the speed of I, I, I think he's more speaking like uh, because you need to do like all these small windows, right? So, of course, as fast you go, more you can scan over. Uh, uh, and, well, yeah. uh, Brian, so, would, Brian would be able to answer this better. Uh, there are advantages, and we even use overlapping windows. Uh, you can do very wide windows, but if you do it narrower, you have a better chance of getting uh, the mass assignments of the fragments. But, and, and again, I've heard Brian explain it, and I need to get that rationale down. down. But the, the instrument can scan very fast, yeah. but you have advantages. We don't use 24MZ, we use 8MZ windows. Um, okay. Although we sometimes on a very small set have a, a little different strategy, but that I like because you have less individual proteins at any one or peptides at any one time being fragmented. Okay. And, and, and I don't know, are you, do you use high, high as well, right? Also high resolution for your MS oh, yes. MS? Yeah. yeah. But, but it's not that high. I, I'd have mm -hmm. to pull up the numbers. You're not using the ultra high ones. It, it's okay. either 17.5 or 35,000. It, it depends. The slower instrument is you'll have to, compromise on what setting you use. But with the fast Lumos, 
we don't have to even have that high of a resolution. Yeah. Uh, Fabio has also a question. I think you already mentioned about this uh, in silico spectral libraries, right? That's what that's yeah. all, that, all we use. Now, I will yeah. tell you that what I'm finding now, and it's something uh, people don't necessarily think of, but you need to include, you know, perhaps a mixture, contaminants library, depending if you're doing species. People often have serum in there, and uh, many people don't consider that. So with yeah. the in silico libraries, we just blend them together. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's worth it's trying. Great. It, and what happens to me, is, and I've been working from home since the beginning of March, I will be going back in, our classes are starting to be in person in our meetings, mm -hmm. but I process all the DIA data. My lab staff, they accommodate me because it lets me have something fun to do. And so I remote in and I am processing it. And then if I know a run's going to be finished in the morning, I rush to turn on the computer and see <laughs> because uh, I, I want to see the results. And then but what I'm able to do with the remote is to meet with the investigators and the students and go over the data with them. And then they do get that scaffold DIA file or the regular scaffold file that they can export, examine, do whatever they need. Uh, Giuseppe, he also has a question. Wonderful uh, indeed. Encyclopedia is a program. It does not have the organisms. It's just what Brian called the way of processing the libraries. And Encyclopedia is a software, a lot of this is available on Skyline. You could do the whole workflow on Skyline, but I have done it and it is not as easy as doing it with the Scaffold DIA software, because the Scaffold DIA software, you don't need anything but the libraries. And then since you can use the ProSit library and you also have to have a FASTA for your species, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people are congratulating you. Um, yeah, you can check this later. And I think we don't have further question. So I just have to, again, thank you very much. It was a privilege for us to have you here. I uh, can't wait to come and visit you in person. Oh, well, please, that, that will be great. That will be great. On a dia. <laughs> let, 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 let's hope, right, that uh, we all get uh, our shots. Brazil, it's not the best place to come at the moment, as you probably no. know. No. But Maybe uh, in a few years. <laughs> we will survive, I'm sure. Yeah. And well, tell me you'll survive too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm so glad I had a chance to speak. And, and really, Gilberto, and you know how to get in touch with me, and I'm yes. very happy to meet with anybody who is interested. I, I think we, we should uh, find a time and we can maybe make a Zoom talk to, to talk a little bit about, about the, the settings and how to to make a really nice DIA experiment. Yes, I would be that'd be great. For that. Okay, so thank you very, very much and have a nice evening. Thank you, thank you, you too. Bye now. Bye, Sue. Thank you.